sure there's enough time for both of you. So I see folks here, the numbers are going up and appreciate folks logging on. Welcome everyone once again to uh, Cancer Center Grand Rounds. And we're really very privileged today to have two of our exceptional uh, physician scientists uh, presenting, uh, you know, really, uh, and, and frankly, what's exciting is it, it once again highlights uh, the extraordinary work in immunology and immunobiology at Yale and, and at the impact on this ultimately in our cancer therapy and, and our understanding of cancer biology. So let me turn to our first speaker to ensure we have time. Um, our first speaker is Dr. David Hafler, who, as you know, is the Ergoli Professor and Chair of the Department of Neurology and Professor of Immunology, Immunobiology. And David's uh, accomplishments are, are really uh, quite legion. Renee actually prepared a synopsis, and I just so that I want to make sure David has time to present, I won't go through all of it, but his accomplishments in terms of understanding uh, and advancing neuroscience and understanding human autoimmunity and, and understanding how to leverage our understanding of immunology to uh, impacting human disease is really quite impressive. And among his uh, awards include the Distal Prize uh, for MS Research, uh, the University of Miami Distinguished Alumni Award, the American Neurology Association Adams Lectureship, and uh, most recently, and I think a year or so ago, election to the National Academy of Medicine. And, and David has really been uh, an incredibly engaged member of our Cancer Center faculty. I think David's leadership, I think, has advanced the cause of our brain tumor program, among other things. And uh, David, thank you for making the time to share your work with us today. Uh, Thank you, Charlie. It's really a pleasure uh, to be here. And let me turn this on and um, turn myself off. So um, what I'd like to do today is to present um, some new unpublished work, which really uh, epitomizes to me a physician scientist of learning from the patient. And uh, what I, just in the nutshell, what I'm going to show you is a very fundamental question, uh, which is what induces the checkpoint inhibitors, in particular PD-1, TIM-3, LAG-3, TIGIT on human T cells? And that's going to be the nature of the talk. The, the work has been submitted for publication. Uh, it was put online on BioRx if anyone's interested in seeing the paper itself. And up front, I want to really acknowledge Tomo Samita, who really, who really performed this work in our laboratory. Tomo is now an assistant professor in, uh, in pursuing this work. Uh, I want to acknowledge my long-term collaborator, Vijay Kutru. Uh, yes, you see a Yale a sticker that he was here helping us recruit students, don't tell the people in Boston, and Jai Dolberg and Asaf Mahdi who did the computational work. So the question is, what are the regulatory mechanisms for induction of co-inhibitory receptors on human T cells? What I'll show you is, surprisingly, type 1 interferons induce co-inhibitory co receptors on human T cells. So that's the bottom line of what I'm going to show you over the 30 minutes. We worked through the in vitro transcriptional regulatory network for this interferon beta response. And then we identified an in vivo model where a viral load strongly correlates with type 1 interferon signature, which allowed us to perform an in vivo validation of the in vitro interferon transcriptional regulatory network co-inhibitory receptor. So that's what my talk will be. Now, it's been known for a number of years, the work um, from VJ uh, Kutru and V. Regev, and we've had a program project grant, uh, two program project grants looking at co-inhibitory molecules, William Sharp, for well over 25 years. Um, that PD-1, TIM-3, LAG-3, and TIGIT are co-regulated and expressed uh, as a module. Uh, so here we have, uh, hopefully you can all see the pointer I won't advance the slide while I'm doing this, but you can see that their uh, expression of um, PD-1, TIM-3, LAG-3, and TIGIT uh, on CD4 and CD8 cells, that they're modulated together. And that this is induced by IL-27. Uh, here we have the induction of TIM-3, not so much PD-1, but LAG-3 and TIGIT by IL-27. You knock down IL-27 in the mouse, you lose the induction by IL-27. That's the upregulation and downregulation by the knockdown. 
Now, it's been known for a long time that uh, type 1 interferon signatures are enriched in chronic viral infection in both mouse and, and humans, and that chronic viral infection induces T cell exhaustion, uh, uh, really first uh, uh, is identified by Rafi Ahmed in the HIV system and um, in uh, LCMV infection. And that's associated with expression of co-inhibitory receptors, such as PD-1, TIM3, LAG3, and TIGIT. Here's interferon signature with the LCMV model, suggesting that there may be an association with type 1 interferons uh, and these co-inhibitory molecules. So we wish to ask, do they induce these receptors? Again, here's what I showed you in terms of mouse. Uh, and uh, in our first experiments, and um, when I Googled in photograph of human, I swear this is what showed up and I no way mean to denigrate mouse immunologists by showing this picture. But what one can see is that in CD4 cells, uh, either with, uh, with no cytokine, IL-27 or interferon beta, this market induction uh, of, uh, of TIM3, LAG3 and PD-1 uh, by uh, interferons. So now let me go into more depth to, to show this. Here's how the experiments were done. Uh, we took CD4, CD8 cells that were CD um, uh, that were um, CD45 negative, uh, but positive that is uh, naive T cells, and stimulate them for for, 90, for different time points with CD3 plus minus IL27 and interferon beta, and one can see the induction of, uh, here's a control, the market induction of LAG3 and TIM3 with interferon. Here's a control and here's looking at TIM3 PD-1. Here's a summary of data with TIM3 LAG3 and PD-1 individually and a summary of TIM3 LAG3 PD-1 positive cells. We see this market induction by type 1 interferons, interferon beta of these co-inhibitory molecules. But surprisingly, unlike in the mouse, where TIGIT is uh, co-regulated, part of the module, with these other co-inhibitory molecules, uh, in human, we saw that uh, TIGIT, and here's TIGIT expression, in the presence of interferon is markedly decreased from 25% down to 4, uh, 12% uh, from 28%. When we looked at RNA expression, we saw there, in fact, two modules, one with interferon with LAG3, TIM3, PD-1 increased with interferon beta, and the other module with TIGIT, uh, um, uh, the, the TNF receptor S9, uh, other modules, uh, CD160 being decreased by type 1 interferon. So these data show that in humans, there are two modules regulated by interferon that in fact go in opposite directions. And here's the kinetics over time, the induction of, of TIM3, LAG3, PD-1 with the decrease uh, in TIGIT. So just to take a step back, why do we have an interest in TIGIN? I mentioned this because uh, under the leadership of Antonio Amora, we're about to embark upon a phase one clinical trial in patients with glioblastoma with anti-TIGIT um, or anti-PD-1 or a combination of, uh, of the two, working with, uh, with uh, Jen Amaloterno and led in my lab by Liliana Luca. So why an interest in TIGIN? This work goes back to 2012, work done by Esther Lozano in the laboratory. We've always been impressed with the biologic effects of blocking uh, with anti-TIGIT. So looking at uh, TBET, the gamma deferon, uh, GATA3, um, uh, RF9, and, uh, um, and um, RRC uh, expression. And one can see that with uh, anti-TIGIT antibody, there's a marked loss of these cytokines in culture. And if you knock down TIGIT, here with an SHRNA, you have market increases in gamma deferon and decreases dial 10. So comparing PD-1 and, and TIGIT in our hands in human systems, been very impressed with the effects of TIGIT. And also just comparing MS to glioblastoma, there really isn't a big difference between PD-L1 or PD-1 between MS and brain tumors, but there's a virtual absolute difference between TIGIT expression, particularly on the CD8 cells in patients with GBM, virtually absent in MS. And here's looking at TIGIT by flow in TILs versus blood, uh, suggesting the potential importance of TIGIT uh, in the central nervous system for glioblastoma. So first we wanted to work through, uh, after that uh, identification of the effect of type 1 interferons, wanted to work through the in vitro transcriptional regulatory network. 
uh, so we use the same model um, that the Regev uh, and Nir Yosef uh, used uh, in terms of setting up, uh, identifying the TH17 a regulatory network. And this was work done by uh, Asaf uh, in VJ's lab. So we needed to have high resolution transcriptomic data to construct the regulatory network. For those of you who aren't engaged in, in, um, in in terms of looking at RNA. Now, what we used to do is to take a T cell, stimulate, measure the RNA four hours later and say, this is what it is. But we've learned that there are complex regulatory networks uh, and one needs to really do this with kinetics over time to construct a dynamic regulatory network. So to perform this, this network, we took naive CD4, CD8 cells, stimulate them, um, at, measure them at different time points with control versus type 1 interferon, did bulk RNA sequencing. We did 34 samples times three replicates with the same healthy donor. And we decided that uh, rather than looking at human variation, which is significant mediated by the, by the genetics of the individuals, we would do what mouse immunologists do, which is pick one strain of mice and study it in, in detail. And we measured, we did RNA-seq, RT-PCR, and protein for flow. So the, this is a transcriptomic analysis of interferon beta at high temporal resolution. We saw a differential expression of gene levels for eight different time points with interferon stimulation. Here's a log two expression. So we have differential expression patterns. We have an early expression pattern here and here. We have an intermediate expression pattern, a late expression pattern, over here. And finally, a bimodal expression pattern goes up, down, and back up. So in performing the just transcriptomic analysis, uh, we look divided into transcription factors. So here's CD4 cells with different kinetics. And these are different transcription factors. Again, we can see early transcription factors, intermediate and late transcription factors induced. And we identified different co-inhibitory receptors and different T cell related genes for both the CD4 and for the CD8 population. Again, in looking at the effect of interferon and what it does in terms of transcriptional networks is critical to look over time because there's a dynamic change in these transcription factors and co-inhibitory receptors uh, over time. So we identified the most differentially expressed transcription factors uh, and uh, about 20 of them here. And these are transcription factors that were differentially regulated and decreased in both CD4 and CD8 T cells. And uh, we, as a reality check, we asked if these were known um, interferon responsive genes. So here's the uh, uh, IFN responsive, uh, responsive gene score over time. And then the green represents regulators for co-inhibitory receptors until the yellow HIV uh, signatures in progressive patients, and then IL-27 regulators. So we we want to examine these transcriptional these transcriptional factors uh, in detail. So in order to do this and present a dilemma, we had to develop new technology because I called the Heisenberg uncertainty principle of immunology the process of examining the cell with activation perturbs the system, similar of looking for an electron after hitting it with HV. So we had to develop a gene knockdown to early time points and primary T cells without activating the T cells. And again, this is all work uh, developed by Tomo, uh, by Tomo Sumida. Uh, we used an efficient lentivirus vectors that developed by Werner Green. And basically one takes uh, uh, viral-like particles, VLPs, which is incorporated with VPX, which degrades uh, SAM, uh, SAMHD1, and removes the restriction so you can transfect uh, primary human T cells with the SAMS1, which now allows transfection uh, with the SHRNA HIV, HIV lentivirus. And all this can be done in non-activated T cells, you can knock down the gene, and then uh, do the, uh, uh, the incubation. So here we have naive CD4 cells incubated without CD3, CD28 with this procedure, knocking down the different genes, and then they're stimulated with and without interferon beta, um, and then measured five days later. And then we perform facts, uh, GFP, uh, of, uh, the, we sorted the GFP positive cells, were knocked down and did bulk RNA sequencing. And you can see very efficient knockdown in the GFP positive cells with these different transcription factors. So this is a monumental amount of work uh, uh, performed by TOMO. 
So we perform principal component analysis to changes in the total RNA expression after the interferon signature associated with each knockdown. So let me just say that again. So this, these are PCA plots. We knocked down each transcription factor and then looked at all the RNA expression and then uh, put that into a principal component one and principal component two. And what that revealed is that the interferon one stimulated genes are positively re regulated by what we call interferon regulator module one. This modulator increased the downstream um, uh, interferon stimulated genes, whereas module two uh, represented uh, transcription factors that negatively regulated the uh, interferon, uh, interferon genes. So to go into more detail, uh, we first have uh, the interferon regulated module one. So a, uh, something that uh, a, a transcription factor that knocks down the gene will lead to decreased expression, which means it's positively regulating. So the interferon regulated module one regulates uh, uh, the conical interferon stimulated genes over here, whereas interferon regulated module two over here regulates these non-canonical genes, uh, interferon stimulated genes. Perhaps a greater interest was looking at the co-inhibitory receptors. So we have interferon regulated module one over here, which is BATH, NAF, ETS2, SP140, which differentially regulate LAG3, PD1, uh, PDL1, uh, SLAM, F6, and other transcription factors. And then we have STAT1 and STAT3, which positively regulate. TIM3, but not LAG3. So we see that these different transcription factors differentially regulate different co-inhibitory receptors. And here's a, a summary, the data I just showed you, which is the effect of these transcription factors uh, per to under interferon stimulated uh, stimulation. So again, there are two modules of transcription factors based on their global effects on interferon stimulated genes. They're bidirectionally regulated by different modules of transcription factors. And then co-inhibitory receptors are also regulated by interferon associated transcription factors and which upregulate and downregulate these receptors. So we have, for example, a mod in module one, the, uh, in, which is a BAF ETS2 MAF1, which positively regulate LAG3 TIM3 and PD1, but negatively regulate uh, TIGIP, BTL, uh, BTLA, and CD160. Again, going along with the flow cytometry data. And again, as I showed you, STAT1 and 3 here positively regulate TIM3, but negatively regulate uh, PD1. So then we performed a hierarchical backbone network analysis of transcription factors. Uh, I'll just go over this very briefly, but basically looked at gene expression over time, differential expression, uh, protein DNA bonding, a transcription factor databases, integrated those data, looked at a rank list of transcription factors, which we perturbed and knocked down, as I showed you, integrated those data into a refined network model. And what we found was that the early and intermediate network contained more upregulated transcription factors than downregulated. In contrast, the late network had more downregulated and upregulated transcription factors. And interferon induced differentiation involves dominance of the upregulated transcription factors in the first 16 hours over here, which then the dominance of downregulated transcription factors over here. And just a summary, so there were dominant transcription factors that bridge each wave to the next. So the green circles represent a transcription factors that are differentially expressed in one transcriptional wave, whereas the uh, purple circles represent transcription factors that are differentially expressed in all transcriptional waves. So KLF and STAT2 are early intermediate uh, transcription factors. MAF, uh, uh, BLIMP1, and MIP are uh, intermediate transcription factors. And STAT1, HIF1A, and TBET are bimodal transcription factors. I in part show this it, just to get the, the, the bigger picture of the, uh, what nature does in terms of the uh, biologic complexity of these systems. So um, a dear friend of mine, some of you may know, uh, one of the great uh, textbook authors of immunology, um, Abul Abbas, would say to me, in vivo veritas, and then in vitro maybe.
So the challenge for us was to find an in vivo system which could replicate all this lovely uh, in vitro data. So I'd like to show you an in vivo model that we did not develop, but nature developed for us, where the viral load strongly correlates with interferon T cell signature, which is COVID-19. So uh, this is work that is presently under revision at Nature Communication, uh, led by a team of individuals I referred to at the end, uh, where we perform single cell analysis of patients with uh, healthy controls and various COVID-19 samples of individuals with mild, severe, or moderate or severe disease. And basically, for the purpose of this talk, what we found is that was a very strong correlation between the interferon score and the viral load as measured by PCR in nasal swabs. In fact, if you look at the correlation of time difference between, that's here, uh, and the respective change interferon score, we had a remarkable R squared of 0.97. So nature had accidentally given us a in vivo model of type 1 interferons and their effect on T cells. So if you look at the interferon signature, uh, it's higher in progressive COVID patients. Here's control, stable, progressive CD4, CD8 cells. One can see that the type 1 interferon score went up with more progressive disease. So then we wish to ask, uh, looking at these, uh, the interferon stimulated T cells in ex vivo, uh, were they similar to what we saw in vitro with our uh, interferon transcriptional signature? And the answer is yes. So here is CD4 cells, CD8 cells. This, uh, this uh, column here are the controls, stable, and progressive patients. So we see this module two upregulated. These are highly upregulated. PD-1, TIM-3, CTO-4, LAG-3, precisely what we saw in vitro uh, in uh, CD4 and CD8 cells, whereas module one, uh, which um, led to downregulation, again, of TIGIT, uh, BTLA, CD-160, uh, and, uh, and such. So we had a extremely a good, good uh, recapitulation of what we saw uh, in vitro. Uh, here's expression of co-inhibitory receptors between controls and COVID-19 patients. Just to summarize, here's LAG3 going up, TIG, um, TIM3 going up, whereas TIGIT, uh, SLAM6, and LAR1 all went down, similar to what we saw in vitro. So we looked at the uh, T cells induced in vitro, um, which led to with an interferon score and ask if that really mirrored the transcriptional wave score on dividing COVID CD4 and CD8 T cells. And basically one can see then dividing CD4 and 8 cells uh, that the in vitro interferon score very much recapitulated we saw in vitro. And finally, we looked at the relation between regulators that we saw in vivo and in vitro in this intermediate wave network uh, the positive regulated transcription factors in red, negative in blue. And we saw that SP140 is a bi-directional regulator. So this is the regulator which induces LAG3 and other co-inhibitory molecules while inhibiting, um, uh, uh, going the opposite direction for TIGIT. And, and we looked at the relationship between late phase COVID for LAG3, TIM3, and PD1, and found that BCL3 and STAT3 are positive regulated for LAG3 and TIM3. And finally, uh, looking directly in patients to the SP140, BCL3, and STAT3 were all elevated in COVID-19 cells. So we're able to recapitulate what we saw in terms of the induction, these co-inhibitory molecules uh, in vivo in terms of what we saw in vitro. So in summary, interferon is a major driver of co-inhibitory receptor regulation in human T cells. The computational and biologic approaches identifies regulatory networks under interferon one responses in human T cells. There are modules of transcription factors that control interferon stimulated genes, co-inhibitory receptors under interferon, which really highlights the novel non-canonical transcription factors beyond the conventional jack stat pathways that we previously knew about. We then demonstrate the uh, relevance of our in vitro T cell type 1 interferon responses by integrating single cell RNA-seq data from COVID-19 patients where a strong T cell interferon 1 response was observed. And finally, we identify SP140 as a key regulator that differentiates lag 3 and digit expression 
an acute viral infection, uh, as well as our in vivo systems. So let me just acknowledge the individuals. Again, this truly represents the work of Tomo Samita. I uh, hear members of the laboratory contributed to the various parts of this. My long-term long collaborator, B.J. Kutru, Shai Dolberg and Asaf Mahdi, and also want to acknowledge the COVID work led by um, uh, Avia Unterman with Tomo, uh, with Jonas Schwup, and uh, Naftali Kaminsky. So I'll stop there and take any question. Thank you. David, thank you. Uh, what an incredible uh, body of work and uh, congratulations on sorting through what is clearly a very complex regulatory system. Let me ask, uh, and this is sort of my concrete question, which is, um, you know, obviously you're sorting through what's driving expression of TIM3, LAG3, TIGIT, and uh, realizing that almost the holy grail today is what's the next PD-1. So does this work help us understand the relative merits of these targets in, in the future of immuno-oncology or, or give us some insight there? It's a great question. I think the short answer is probably not uh, at one level. It, it gives us insight. Well, I guess one could ask what, uh, what induces type 1 interference in different tissues and, um, and, and how are tumors, so presumably in tumors are secreting type 1 interferons. Um, well, we know they are and that that may be influencing the local tumor environment. But the reason why I say no is my suspicion is that each organ has its own set of regulatory modules for controlling how T cells um, uh, work. Um, we just completed an extensive analysis paper published in Science Immunology doing a single cell RNA-seq uh, in T cells from normal spinal fluid. There's normal Yale graduate students. and see that over 50% of the T cells in this CSF are PD-1 positive, high expression TIGIT, TIM3, um, uh, with spontaneous production of gamma interferon. So I think each organ, and again, this is why I showed the MS GBM data, I, I think looking at what is expressed in tumors compared to autoimmune disease, which goes the opposite direction, may give us insight as to what is the next holy grail co-inhibitory molecule. I think that would be perhaps the best way of, of addressing it. And this is more mechanistic. And it was surprising because it said VJ uh, kept saying, well, it's IL-27, can't you find it? Kept saying, well, we keep looking and kept saying, well, you're doing the experiment wrong. And I didn't show them the picture of Donald, but you know, we just couldn't get it to work. And then we explored different uh, co-inhibitory molecules. And, and it's a very simple observation and actually predicted based on all the viral immunology work. Yeah, thank you. Um, Ann Haberman has a question, which is how long does the T cell response to interferon persist? And why would this be a desirable response during a viral infection? Well, I, I think, um, you know, in terms of COVID, there are clearly two phases. The initial uh, phase of the um, high interferon response, we saw at the intermediate phase, and then with time, disappears. Uh, if one can generate, so there really are these biphasic interferon responses. Um, this is what nature does to try to clear clear viruses, um, and we suspect that one reason why patients uh, do badly, and we're positive, is that the loss of TIGIT. Um, which is induced by interference. We have persistent high interference signature leads to a loss of immune regulation. Um, we actually wrote a, a grant, a supplemental grant, um, hypothesizing that TIM3 PD1 would go up and TIGIT would go down um, in COVID patients. Uh, I don't like hypothesis driven science, it seemed like a long shot, and we're shocked to see that was going on. So. Um, so in terms of why it'd be desirable response, because interference help clear viruses, but then, and I think it becomes a less desirable response with time. And um, we suspect that to raise the issue that a loss of TIGIT, which is really quite remarkable in these individuals, may relate, relate to the hyperimmune response that we see in patients. Well, David, thank you for really a terrific talk and and thank you for sharing the the work in progress um, it's really impressive let me now turn to our uh, next speaker dr harry kluger who as you all know is, is a professor of medicine and along with marcus bosenberg leads our yale spore and skin cancer which we're so pleased got renewed about a year ago and continues to be extremely productive 
Harriet's work uh, in the cancer center has been really uh, sort of the, the triple threat. Obviously she is a, a highly respected and highly sought after physician, but at the same time, uh, a leader in research and immunology and melanoma, and also a leader of our education program. And uh, not many people can, uh, can do all that and do it so well. Uh, Harriet's work, I think, has really been instrumental in understanding the biology of melanoma. How do we leverage immunobiology towards novel therapies? And, and frankly, I suspect we won't necessarily hear about it today, but her work on, on metastases as well has really, I think, been very insightful. But Harriet, uh, thank you for taking the time and sharing uh, your work with us. Thank you, Charlie. And thanks for that wonderful introduction. Um, I'm just going to share my screen here. So it's always humbling to talk after David Heffler, but that was the assignment I received. So <laughs> I will do my best here. So I'm going to be talking to you about one of the SPORE projects, um, which focuses on co-stimulating the, inna the innate and the adaptive immunity to treat melanoma. Um, so just a few fast facts about melanoma. So it's a disease of the relatively young. Most patients pre uh, present between age 45 and 55. The incidence has been going up actually for decades already. So just by way of example, in 2003, there were around 54,000 new cases in the United States. And just a decade and a half later, it was already up to 87,000. It's now the fifth most common malignancy among men and the seventh among women. But fortunately, most of our patients present with stage one disease. So stage one refers to disease that's confined to the skin and is thin. Stage two is confined to the skin and thicker. Stage three is um, the disease that's, that's spread to the lymph nodes. And stage four is distant dissemination. And that's essentially what kills patients. So we're really going to be talking about stage four disease today. Um, so for mortality, interestingly, it was going up as well. So from 2003, 7,600 deaths, 2017, 9,700 deaths. But if you start tracking later on, 2019, the death rate started to go down for the very first time, 7,230 deaths. And the projected number for this year is 6,850. And this is because of our improved metastatic um, uh, improved therapies for metastatic disease, particularly immunotherapy, and that's what I'm going to be talking about today. So we've known for years that some uh, melanoma patients are cured by old-fashioned therapy. If you do a metastatectomy, this is an old series published in 2011, you can see that eight or ten years out, approximately five or seven percent of patients are still alive. Chemotherapy, you actually see a similar kind of a figure, and we don't think chemotherapy really prolongs survival. Maybe it's just natural history of disease that some people live for a long time. And over here on the right, you see the, the five-year survival data from um, our flagship phase three study of ipilimumab alone versus nivolumab alone versus the combination thereof. At, uh, where at five years, you see 26% of patients are alive with IPI alone, 44% with NDPD1 alone, and 52% or maybe even higher than that with the combination of the two drugs. So what we're really trying to do in the melanoma field, especially the drug development field, is to raise the this tail at the end of the curve. So this is a figure that I borrowed from one of Marcus's students, Irina, who I'll mention as we go along just showing that targeted therapy and chemotherapy, you're very low down here with ipilimumab. We're starting to push up. We're pushing up further with anti-PD-1, even further with the combination. But really what we need to do is to get new drugs and drug combinations. So hopefully in the next five years, we'll have a five-year survival of 80% and eventually we'll reach 100%. And until then, we still have employment. So what are the limitations of immunotherapies? The Society of Immunotherapy, or SITSI, which is the big society that Mario presides over, um, recently formed a task force to define, to, to provide some clinical definitions of, um, of the limitations. So firstly, not all patients respond up front. We call that primary resistance. Then there's some patients that will respond and subsequently progress. So we call that secondary resistance or acquired resistance. The third problem that we have is that we sometimes give combinations. So for example, when we give ipilimumab and nivolumab, we give the two together for four cycles, and then we continue with nivolumab monotherapy. So if somebody has a nice response in the beginning, and then 18 months later, when they're on monotherapy maintenance, they then progress. 
is that resistance to the combination or is that resistance to monotherapy? And all of these things need to be defined. Um, and then how do we define regrowth after a patient stops therapy? So we normally treat for a limited period of time, be that one year, one year or two years, however long we treat for a specific disease. If a patient is then off therapy and then has regrowth, does that mean they're actually resistant to the original clone because in theory the tumor should have been gone? Or um, are, are they just dependent on it and we need to continue? So um, the, this task force is starting to define all of these um, categories and to come up with um, specific definitions that can be used for clinical for, for drug development so that all trials are designed the same way. Um, we've started on that, but we're chipping away at all of these questions. And I think many um, of our Yale faculty are actually participating in this endeavor. But concurrent with the clinical definitions, we really need to work on the science. So really what I'm going to talk about mostly today is, is translation, going back and forth. So what, why do patients develop resistance? Well, many, many potential mechanisms of resistance have been described. And I think um, you know, half of the cancer immunology world is now working on one or other of these. So some of, the, some of these tumors are just desert tumors, lack of, till, of tumor infiltrating um, lymphocytes within the tumors. You can have ineffective priming of your T cells. We know that defective antigen presentations, such as um, by loss of beta to microglobulin in the tumor cells will cause resistance. Sometimes T cells get exhausted, as David just mentioned. Of course, lack of PDL1 in the tumor or in the tumor microenvironment suggests that we don't that PD1 inhibition isn't going to do very much over there. Um, and then the other co-stimulatory or co-inhibitory molecules that David just mentioned, particularly TIGID and LAG3, might also be present, and maybe it's just not sufficient in all cases to inhibit PD1 or PDL1. Um, and finally, there, um, there are many other immune inhibitory cells that we need to focus on in the tumor microenvironment, and sometimes those might just be overpowering the role of the T cells. So examples are MDSCs and Tregs, which um, might need inhibition as well. So we, when we started putting together the renewal of the spore, um, one of the projects that we um, worked on is, spe is specifically looking at the innate immune system. So Sue Keck, when she was here, provided um, all of the preliminary data, which I'll be reviewing very quickly. And since Sue has left, Marcus has become a key collaborator. And actually, it's now become a whole village and a whole party because all of the investigators and trainees listed over here on the right are quite involved in this project. And I'll mention some of their um, contributions as we go along. So Sue started off looking at Marcus's um, EM 1.7 model. So I'm sure everybody knows that this is a cell line that was generated from a, from a GEM model. It's um, BRAF mutant and P10 and CDK into a null. And when you take this YAM 1.7 and you treat it with anti-PD1, you see over here, there's absolutely no tumor regression. If you irradiate the cells and generated the second, this daughter cell line called YAMR 1.7, um, ER stands for exposed to radiation, you get some sensitivity to anti-PD1, but ultimately with time, these tumors do grow out as well. Um, so the first question that Sue asked was, what was actually in these, um, in, in these tumors? So all of this work was done by Kurt Perry, who's over here um, on the right. We can see his picture, and he's actually one of the new fellows that matched to our program. We'll be, we're very thrilled to have him as part of our medical oncology um, fellowship. Um, so first question that they asked was, what was the infiltrating um, tumor content? Uh, in, these mass, in these mass melanomas. And it turns out that the predominant cell type was actually TAMs or tumor-associated macrophages. The next question that they asked was, um, what, what kind of macrophages are these? Are they more inflammatory or inhibitory? Um, you know, the classic definition of M1 and M2. And over here on the right, you see a contour plot where on the x-axis, you've got F480 and the y-axis, you've got Li6C. Um, it turns out that there are at least three populations, and there are probably more than that. And just in a nutshell, the TAMs that, are, that have high Li6C Li6 and low F480 are those that are more inflammatory, and the ones on the right over here are those that are presumed to be more inhibitory. Um, so at that point, they said, okay, we've got, we've got these TAMs, we need to try to modulate them. 
And there are many, many mechanisms out there for modulating TAMs, but the ones that they chose to work on were CD40 agonism and CSF1R inhibition. And in the beginning, they used a small molecule inhibitor. So if you take these EMRA cells, and um, implant them in mice, and you treat either with control vehicle or with a CD40 agonist, um, you'll see some, some decrease in the size of the tumors with the CD40 agonist. If you give the CSF1 receptor inhibitor, you get a similar amount of tumor reduction. If you give the two together, you get synergism, as you can see by the red line over here. So to look back into those similar contour plots, what is the content of these different um, tumors within the mice treated in the graph over here on the left? You can see that when you give doublet therapy, the CD40 agonist and the CSF1 receptor inhibitor, the main difference is that you get an increase in this little um, group over here on the right in the upper corner, um, which are Li6C high and F480 low and are presumed to be more inflammatory macrophages. Um, and that's essentially verified on the bar graph over here on the left, on the right. At the bottom over here, you can see that the changes in the, in the immune infiltrating content. And I think what's most interesting over here is that when you give the CD40 agonist along with the CSF1 receptor inhibitor, you do get an increase of infiltration of T cells. So possibly we, we might be able to make desert, those um, desert tumors more inflamed by using a regimen such as this. And in addition, you get more PD-1 high T cells. Um, so, so Catherine Miller-Jensen on the main campus has developed a technology for single cell cytokine secretion. And she looked at what the difference of, um, was between these different um, treatment arms. And what you can see here on the principal component analysis on the left is that if you only treat with the CSF1 receptor inhibitor versus the CD40 agonist inhibitor alone versus the combination, you get quite a different pattern of um, cytokine secretion. On the right, or I'm sorry, in the middle over here, you've got a heat map, which essentially depicts the differences. And some of them are highlighted over here on the right for cytokines and chemokines, pretty much as, um, as one would expect, when you give the combination therapy, you get an increase in the TNF alpha, um, IL-12B, uh, IL-6, et cetera, and the same for the panel of the cytokines, of the chemokines at the bottom. So essentially, the doublet therapy over here is inducing quite, quite vast changes um, in the animals. And what does it do to the T cells? What else is important over here? What you see on this figure here is that um, when you give the doublet therapy, you can actually abrogate the effect if you give anti-TNF alpha or anti-interferon gamma, again, highlighting the, the importance of the T cells in this process as well. So with that, at the time, we concluded that CSF1 receptor inhibitors and CD4 the agonist treatment can induce an inflammatory TAM population in the, tum in the tumor microenvironment. It also induces a functional T cell response. Um, and this is dependent on TNF alpha and interferon gamma. And these were the preliminary data that we had to start our project. So when we received funding, um, we, uh, by then Curtis Perry had gone off for residency. So Bill Damsky came in to help us and you'll see a whole cast of trainees along the way over here. So Bill, Bill did a heroic job over here with um, bringing us closer to the clinic. So we decided at that point not to use the CSF1 receptor inhibitor, the small molecule inhibitor, but rather to move towards an antibody because of precision um, of, of uh, drugging our target. Also in the clinical arena, it would be very difficult to take a patient who progressed on a PD-1 inhibitor and not to continue the PD-1 inhibitor with the next regimen. That's essentially how most regimens are now being developed for melanoma and renal cell as well. So the question is, what can we add on to a PD-1 inhibitor to get us there? So he, these are large groups of mice um, treated either with control vehicle, either one of the three drugs alone. So anti-PD-1, CD40 agonist or CSF1 receptor, any doublet um, of the, uh, from among those three and the triplet. And you can see by the brown line over here that by far the triplet therapy was superior on the right, you see the spider plots for the size of these tumors, which in the beginning they'll grow and then shrink. Um, Irina Krikbaeva, who's an MD PhD student who was in Marcus's lab at the time, or still actually in Marcus's lab, did um, similar experiments on a Renka model 
um, because we wanted to go into the clinic in kidney cancer as well. Again, showing that triple therapy was superior to double therapy. Um, not quite as pretty as in the melanoma models, but that's, and that's consistent with what we see in the clinic whereby um, renal cell patients respond less well to these therapies than melanoma patients. So because it's a SPORE project, you have to have a clinical PI and a basic science PI and everything has to have a clinical trial. So to go back to the bedside, what are we going to do with these data? So we formed collaborations with Bristol Myers Squibb and a company called Apexogen that makes a CD40 agonist, and um, we were able to get them to work together. Um, the problem was that there, were, there was no phase one data for the triplet. Now, cabirolizumab, which is the CSF1 receptor antibody, and nivolumab had been given to hundreds of patients in BMS-led studies, and the activity in melanoma was modest, but there was a little bit of activity. At that point, we knew that a CD40 agonist can have significant activity in melanoma based on studies by, done by the group at Penn already years ago. Um, but we didn't know very much about the, the other combinations. So at the time, Sarah Weiss brought in a phase one, two study of APX005M, in other words, a CD40 agonist, plus NEVO in melanoma and lung cancer, started at around that time. And um, we enrolled a good number of patients there and actually saw phenomenal responses. So this is an example of a patient treated by Dr. Schnoll who had a mucosal melanoma, which tends to be very resistant to ipilimumab and nivolumab, and the patient indeed had progressed on that. Um, so we put the patient on um, the CD40 agonist plus nivolumab, and the patients had a complete response and remains of therapy a couple of years later, we have four of these patients. And other than ipilimumab and nivolumab, we don't actually see this. So maybe this is the answer to Charlie's question is what's the next anti-PD-1? Um, so we're very excited about this molecule. And with that, Sarah Weiss, whose picture over, is over here, and I wrote a phase one um, slash one B or phase two for the combination of the triplet. We partnered with the Yale spore in lung cancer and um, we were able to get support both from the Cancer Center, Bristol-Myers and Apexogen. So the phase one trial design is depicted on this picture over here. In the beginning, we were very anxious because nobody had ever given two macrophage modulating agents together. And we were worried that we were gonna get like diffuse macro activate, macrophage activating syndrome and kill patients. So we had to go very, very gingerly. We were also working with two pharmaceutical companies, each with its own opinion. So cabirolizumab, which was being developed by Bristol Myers Squibb, they'd already, um, they'd already defined the recommended phase two dose, and we had to stick with the dose that they gave us, which was four milligrams a kilogram. We escalated the CD40 agonist very gently, so cohort one only had the doublet therapy um, at a tenth of the recommended phase two dose for the CD40 agonist. We then escalated by a half a log into cohort three and cohort five, and concurrently added the nivolumab on with the goal of ultimately reaching cohort six, which would be full doses at the record for, of uh, cabirolizumab, the apexogen drug and nivolumab at the same recommended phase two dose of each one of these individually. Um, once we get to the uh, to, to cohort six or to the recommended phase two regimen, the plan is to go into um, the phase 1b component, which is, it's essentially three phase 2 studies, each one with its Simon phase 2 design, um, one per disease. Uh, and this, this trial has lots of embedded correlates, both blood-based and tumor-based, um, with pretreatment biopsies, mandatory on-treatment biopsies, etc. So to update you on what's going on with the phase 1 trial, which is an in integral part of the SPORE project, we have completed the phase one, 26 patients in total have been enrolled. Sarah is busy preparing the, the publication for this and it should be going out over the coming weeks. Overall, it was reasonably well tolerated. Um, it certainly wasn't candy though. We saw a lot of periorbital edema as well as diffuse edema, elevations in CPK, AST and ALT, but those didn't appear to be particularly clinically significant fevers and cytokine release, but a lot of fatigue. I think that was the biggest problem. And the other big problem that we saw was get, while there was some activity in some of the patients, it was mostly stable disease and progression of disease and not quite what we'd seen in the mice. The trial has proceeded to the phase 1b component in melanoma and lung cancer. Both are in the first stage. Um, but we've, we've completed the phase one. I'm going to show you some examples of correlative studies that we've done, and this is still a bit of a work in progress. So we looked at um, cytokine panels 
um, before and, and on treatments so are 24 hours later. And you can see nice increase in interferon gamma as well as in, in, in TNF alpha. Um, the different cohorts are listed over here, but cohort five and six are when we hit the, the recommended phase two dose of the apixogen drug. So that's where you see most of the activity. Um, there are other changes in circulating cytokines, and I could spend an hour just talking about this, but I selected a few just to, just to show you what we're seeing. So we've got CCL2, which is a cytokine that's primarily secreted by dendritic cells and macrophages, very high levels at the higher dose levels. Same with IP10, and then the macrophage co um, colony stimulating factor, also highest levels in cohort six, but clear increases across the board. Um, we do have the pre-treatment and on-treatment specimens. Shlomit Jessel, who's a postdoc in my lab, is busy analyzing these. Um, what you see over here is the basic analyses. So these are just this is just immunofluorescence staining, a CD4 and CD8 before treatment and on treatment. So on the left is pre and on the right is post. And you can see an increase in the infiltration of the CD8 cells, which are colored in green. There's also an increase of the CD4s, which are in red. CD68 also actually increase in the amount of CD68 on this particular patient. But in some patients, we actually see the opposite. So over here, you can see that the CD8 cells pre-treatment were much more dense than post-treatment. Um, although you do see some post-treatment, I don't know how well this projects. There's an increase in the CD68 though. Um, it, it, just to highlight one of the challenges that we have with doing these pre and on treatment um, studies in that it may not come from, this, come from the same site. So the pre-treatment was a, a cutaneous tissue metastasis on the back and the post-treatment in this particular patient came from the gallbladder. So it's possible that the tumor microenvironment in the different organs is playing a part over here. Um, but because we didn't see much activity in the phase one trial, we're going back to the bench to try to determine what can we do to improve our trial. So Irina Krikbaeva, who was the postdoc working in, um, I'm sorry, the, the doctoral student in Marcus's lab, partnered with Deanna, who's working in my lab, to ask the question of whether we're actually just giving too much CSF1 receptor antibody. So more isn't always better, particularly when we're trying to polarize macrophages and not necessarily knock them off completely. So when we do these experiments in the mice, um, we were seeing much better activity than the humans. And the question is why? So the doses selected for the murin experiments were somewhat random. We go based on what um, is done by other researchers, what's done by pharma. And the amount that we were giving them was 200 milligrams a kilogram. So we asked the question, well, what happens if we give them more CSF1 receptor antibody and keep the other two drugs steady? And as you can see in this figure over here, if you give more CSF1 receptor antibody, basically doubling the dose, the mice actually do less well, die sooner or are sacrificed sooner. And um, as you can see here on the left, the tumor volume is actually bigger when you give the higher dose of the CSF1 receptor antibody. Um, so we're still debating what to do about that as we go into the clinic. But then in the meanwhile, because it's a small project, we still need to have an ongoing clinical trial. And the question was, well, is the CSF1 re receptor the optimal second target in addition to CD40 agonist and PD1 inhibitors? So it's possible, at least theoretically, that CTLA4 is a better target because um, CTLA4 inhibition um, is, is really key for dendritic cell activation. So Kelly Alino, who's one of our wonderful surgeons in the melanoma group and also a surgeon scientist, is doing work in the lab, primarily Marcus's lab, where she's taking a very aggressive mod, um, marine model whereby she injects these cells into the left ventricle. So they develop vast metastases all over, including in the brain. And this model is particularly resistant to um, anti-PD-1 and anti-CTLA-4. So the question is whether the addition of the CD40 agonist adds something. And as you can see over here with the red bar, the addition of the CD40 agonist does appear to improve the survival of these mice that typically will be dead within 20 days. Um, this is some sub-Q injection data over here on the left, which we don't have time to go through. But with those data, we again ap approached Apexogen and we said, well, maybe we should do a different trial now in parallel. And this is our second trial, which um, Kelly and Sarah worked with me to, to write. Um, so it's a phase one study of the CD40 agonist in combination with ipilimumab and nivolumab in melanoma. 
So just to highlight some of the, cha the, the challenges of a study like this, we know that epilimumab and nivolumab has a toxicity rate of at least 65, 70%. We're talking about these immune-related adverse events all the time. Um, and we also know that sometimes these events occur late. So you can have a patient who's treated, comes off therapy, and six months later develops a horrendous toxicity. So how long, do, how do we design a study like that? How long can we follow the patients for? How long do we go from one cohort to the other? So it took a lot of negotiation back and forth with the FDA, um, but we put a lot of thought into this really slow trial design where we actually have only two dose levels. So dose level one is a, um, is a third of the recommended phase two dose of the, C, of the CD40 agonist, which is the drug that we're adding. And we give ipilimumab and nivolumab. We only treat three patients, uh, monitor the, them for 28 days, and then, in, in, then enroll another four to six. And, um, at that, and all of these six patients then need to be monitored for six weeks. So this is going to take us a long time to get through. But what we're hoping is that we'll have a regimen that may not be more toxic, but that will be significantly more effective than the PD-1 and CTLA-4 that we have right now to finally bring that tail of the curve up to 80%. Um, we have started, we've enrolled three melanoma patients, all have completed their 28 day DLT period, and they did okay with that, but they've not all completed their nine week observation. Before Christmas, we're going to enroll two more patients who've consented and we're looking for the sixth patient, but they all have to be monitored for nine weeks before we can proceed. Um, so I'm going to conclude there that co-targeting the innate and adaptive immune system with a CSF1 receptor inhibitor or antibody plus CD40 agonists results in better anti-tumor activity than either alone. It also increases the CD8 tumor content in animals. If we treat mice bearing PD-1 resistant tumors with, all, with um, these drugs in combination with anti-PD-1, it does look better than the doublet. Um, the findings were confirmed in a renal cell carcinoma model. We're in the clinic already testing this. We're having some difficulty with, um, with insufficient activity. So we're back in the lab right now trying to modify the doses and the regimen before we go back again into the clinic. And this kind of back and forth between the lab and the clinic is something that can only be done um, at a place like this. Um, we're also at the same time um, evaluating the combination with the CTLA-4 inhibitor, and um, hopefully this will be as exciting or more exciting. And just to say the final conclusion that is that it really takes a village to do a project like this. So all of the, uh, the, the folks who've been involved are acknowledged on this slide, the scientific collaborators at Yale, colleagues um, in other labs who've helped a lot through this process, members of my lab, members of the collaborating lab, um, clinical collaborators, pharmaceutical collaborators, patients and their family, and then finally the funding. So I did mention the Spore and Skin Cancer, which, um, which has funded the core project, um, but the K-12 has funded a couple of the investigators here, Kelly Alino and Sarah Weiss, and um, Cancer Center has supported it, and some of our folks have, have, achieved, have received career development awards as well related to this. So with that, I'll stop. I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you for listening. Gloria, thank you. Uh, what a great example of translating science into the clinic. Um, and folks uh, can certainly submit questions online. So let me, I have a question watching, because I, you sort of anticipated my question by adding the CTLA-4 antagonist, but to what extent do you think the triplet might have had uh, greater benefit if they weren't previously exposed to a PD-1 antibody? Well, that's a really good question. So the mice were not exposed to a PD-1 antibody, whereas the humans would. And it's possible that, you know, we, we've, we've just used that up and developed a, yet a new mechanism of resistance. So we haven't done that experiment in the mice, but that's actually a really good next step to do. It's a great thought. We should expose the mice to PD-1 inhibitors and then add on the other ones instead of giving all three up front. And this may be... Uh impossible, but is there any consideration of combining all four agents in previously, I mean, that is a, a CSF1R, CD40, anti-CDL4, CTLA4, and PD-1, and I realize that's a smorgasbord of agents, but is that a conceivable approach? We could, we just got, we're going to get through the first three first, so the CTLA4, CD40, and PD-1, so far we're doing okay with toxicity, 
um, but we're only on the first dose level. It's it, it's very intimidating <laughs> to do all of this. Sure. Um, and then the other question is, in what line do you do it? So what we're trying to do now is to actually move it forward to the first line. That that very last trial that I showed with the CTLA4 antibody, we decided to go in first line, um, mostly because of of memory. So if you get, if you take patients who've had previous CTLA4, you can get additive toxicity over there. Um, but that's a really good idea to do that in the mice. Thank you. Yeah. Well, um, I know we're I know we're just we're at a, we're a little past the hour, um, and I want to be sensitive to everyone's time. So, Harriet and David, thank you both for really exceptional talks. Congratulations on all your work, and to everyone in attendance, thank you for joining us and enjoy your day. Thanks. Bye bye.